It takes two. Amy Eiler, JJ Gordon here on the Mighty 790 KFGO. And it's President's Day. Maybe you have the day off. Maybe your kids are with you today and they aren't normally. It is an odd day. Uh, but we decided to call up the first ladies' man on President's Day because who better to talk about on President's Day than the ladies that made them who they were? Oh, bingo. Andrew Oak is with us, the first ladies' man on KFGO. Andrew, welcome back to KFGO Radio. Oh, great to talk to you both. And you're right. I mean, what better way to celebrate President's Day than talking about first ladies? But we're trying to fix that. We're trying to give both of them their fair due because, I mean, they're, they're, they're all presidents and first ladies, remarkable human beings, incredible Americans, wonderful and, and accomplished revolutionists and thinkers and democratarians and all the other stuff that goes along with it. But, but you know, I'm the first lady's man, so on President's Day, as Abigail Adams so aptly put in a letter to her husband when he was forming the Continental Congress, I remember the ladies. You know, okay, let me ask right off the bat here. Have we always been good stewards of collecting pieces from the first ladies, Andrew Oak? Because you've studied every single one of them. Are there are there certain first ladies who there's less information, there's less correspondence, there's less writings? Yeah, JJ, great question, actually. And, and that's how I, I know that Abigail Adams wrote a letter to her husband that said, remember the ladies. Um, um, and she was talking very, very specifically about what ladies' interests were, what ladies' concerns were, women's interests. This is hundreds of years before they would vote, hundreds of years before they, they would – Yeah, I mean, they, back in the – this is in the 1780s, 1790s, that, that, that women could not vote, women could not have formal education, women could not own bank accounts, women could not own property, on and on and on and on. But Abigail Adams knew and wrote to her husband, she said, remember the ladies. When the ladies are in your favor, the men will be on your side, which means we knew that these women, even back then through Abigail Adams' letter, were more influential than we gave them credit for. But how do we know this? Because in colonial times, the, the colonial version of cleansing your hard drive or, 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 or deleting emails or all that kind of stuff and eliminating literal paper trails back then because they wrote on paper – People often read their letters on their deathbeds or as, they're, as, they're, as they got older and, 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 and knew that the, that the light at the end of the tunnel was, was closer than, than far away. They would read their letters and then throw them in the fireplace. Martha Washington does this, did this. Um, uh, Elizabeth Monroe did this. And, and other first ladies had directives in their wills to say, please burn my letters. I mean, you get it. You know, it's, it's personal. They didn't want stuff hanging out after they were dead and gone and, and couldn't answer to it. or So, you, you know, there's, there's other instances where, where we weren't aware historically so much of what all of this was going to mean in the grand scheme of things, you know, before electricity, God knows, before the Internet and other things like that. So you have lesser known presidents and first ladies like uh, Franklin and Jane Pierce come to mind uh, uh, in, in Concord, New Hampshire. They were going to just plow down their 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 family home um and then the the pierce brigade a group of active women up there got the money together to to raise the the house out up and take it off of the original property that was bought by some you know real estate developer or something like that and find some land that could be appropriated by the state so it really does go up and down of of what we what we care about and and national archives and records administration which own the own and operate that and they represent us we the people we 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 own and operate through our federal government through national archives and records administration presidential museums from hoover up until bush 43 now the next president barack obama is doing something outside of the norm and 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 and, and i'm not sure how this is all going to shake out because it's not open yet it's scheduled to be open in 2025 but every presidential library from Hoover – or presidential uh, museum, rather, with all of the artifacts, all the state gifts, all of the first ladies, you know, uh, dresses and all the other stuff that comes along with it, their, 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 their historical artifacts, um, uh, from Hoover through Bush are run by our federal government, National Archives Records Administration. But the Barack Obama Foundation – is going to own and operate both. And I don't even know how that legally works because a lot of people 
uh, a lot of foreign dignitaries give first ladies and presidents gifts that they're not allowed to receive uh, through laws that have been enacted because they can't receive certain amounts of money and things like that. Perfect example, or prime example, you walk into the Bush 43 Museum and Library in Dallas, Texas. It's the newest. It's the flagship of of the NARA collection of of presidential library museums, which also include the First Ladies. When you walk in, there there are about I don't know maybe 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 ten maybe twelve maybe fifteen display cases, beautiful in this high marble uh, uh, foyer or lobby, and they house gifts of state that were given to Mrs. Bush and President Bush. And it's just remarkable to see what foreign countries give as gift to our presidents and first ladies, the jewelry, all kinds of stuff and decorations and sculptures and things that they're not legally allowed to own. They belong to we, the people. And so as time marched on, we discovered how important this is, but you go far back. And I know that like at the uh, Elizabeth Monroe home in, outside of Charlottesville, Virginia, Ashlawn Highland, they had to collect a lot of the furniture and a lot of even the White House China at auctions and flea markets and eBay and tracking them down and stuff like that. So it's a really, and I chronicle all this in my books uh, of uh, first ladies, um, uh, unusual for their time on the road with America's first lady, volume one and volume two. It tells you who's more documented than others and how they got some of these artifacts. So great question. Okay. Let's talk about the Barack Obama music. I didn't realize that, that his will be different than the others and how that might change the dynamic of it. Could it change what's actually archived there? 100 percent. I, I, there, there's a lot of different implications to this. Uh, typically, the foundations and I, and I ran into this. The foundations don't always play nice with the federal government. Uh, and the Nixon Museum is, is one of them. When I went out to study Pat Nixon in Yorba Linda, California, I, 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 my contact there was within the Nixon Foundation. And there were incredible, incredible documentation. Pat Nixon was, for her time, the most traveled second lady and first lady of all time. She did more diplomatic uh, uh, travel and visits and, and, and goodwill and, 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 and help and philanthropy around the world than, than any other first lady. And then you go back before they were even married, Pat and, and, uh, and, and Richard Nixon, the, the love letters and the courtship just paints. They were so different in public than they were privately, which, you know, most of us or a lot of us are. But with a president and first lady, you see someone who is so quiet and so so stand behind her man, and then someone that is so verbose and 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 kind of grumpy and curmudgeon the 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 the, the, the reputation that Nixon had. But they were a delightful couple, and you read their love letters to each other, and it's just like holy cow! It just paints quite a different picture. So anyway, I go out there to meet with the foundation. We did a whole thing where we got halfway through the museum, and then the folks at NARA said, hey. This is our collection. We own this stuff. You can't, you can't come in here and show this guy, me, the first lady's man. You can't show him our stuff. We want to talk about our stuff. Oh so we had to start half the day over, go back. Yeah, and, and daylight was burning. You know, the, 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 the lantern it's... oil was burning. So there, there's, there's, okay, there's... So, so could that be the reason that the Obama museum no, wants? No, no, no. I, I don't think. I, I don't. I don't. Or think library. So. I, I, I don't. I don't know. So, so foundations typically own the papers and the documentation and and the the and now the virtual you know uh, uh, databases of information and the museums hold what you would expect the the, the physical items the the clothes the gifts um, the cars uh, gosh I mean Reagan Library has an Air Force One. In, I mean, Reagan Museum. The Reagan Museum has a, an Air Force One plane in their museum. And the Nixon Library, when you pull up, has a Marine One helicopter, the one that they left when he you know, resigned, uh, you know, putting up air quotes. But but so um, typically these foundations and these and, and the uh, uh, National Archives Records Administration work hand in hand and seamlessly. And then sometimes, you know, there's some there's some turf wars and stuff like that. But nothing that you you can't get around, and nothing yeah. that's not insurmountable. Um, why uh, President Obama did this, I I don't know. You know, so I don't know what that library is going to look like and how they own these 
it's it's very interesting. And another story comes to mind: the Truman Library and the Truman uh, 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 House. So in Independence, Missouri, there is the Harry S. Truman Library, which is one run by the Truman Foundation, and the museum, which is run by National Archives and Records Administration, and then the historic site, which is run by National Park Service. Oh and gosh. this is the home that the Trumans lived in. Well, when Mrs. Truman died, she's the longest living first lady in history at 97 years old. When she died, what was in the house stayed in the house. And 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 the, the 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 Truman historic site that has some other storage facilities and stuff that Mrs. Truman had set up, the the suit that President Harry Truman got married in, the jacket was in the museum, and the pants were in the National Historic Site, and the paperwork <laughs> that they have to fill out just to put the pants and the coat together to tour for exhibits is quite expansive. I mean it. Documenting the it, it, and it's it's funny, JJ. You you opened up the, the door to this. We've never discussed this. Uh, this is all in my books uh, of of the of the different experiences and the different places I went and the stuff that I learned about all these things. Another great thing about the Truman, I mean, possession is nine tenths of the law, as they say. When Mrs. Truman left the White House, and we didn't, we, we the people, we the the federal government, we the Secret Service, whoever didn't really monitor, you know, as, as closely as we do now of, of things coming and going and who owns what, and where stuff belongs. So Mrs. Truman, you know, the Trumans left the White House. They didn't run for reelection in a third term and they pick up, they pack their bags and they head back to independence. Well, one of the things Mrs. Truman thought to take from the White House was her portrait. Because as she said, it's a painting of me and it's my painting, so I'm taking it with me. And she hung it over the mantle in Independence, Missouri, in her home. Well, fast forward however many years, and, and Lady Bird Johnson is picking up where uh, uh, Jacqueline Kennedy left off in, in historically documenting things and setting up exhibits and making the White House the historic site that it is and the collection that they house. And so she's putting together all the First Lady portraits. Well, they can't find Bess Truman's. No one knows where it is. So Lady Bird, a, a, a woman of action, calls Bess Truman at home. And I, I saw the phone <laughs> that she called her on sitting there in the house, as you would expect, sitting on the wall with a big long cord on it and everything, just like we all had in our houses in the 70s and 80s. And Mrs. Johnson, sitting first lady, said, Mrs. Truman, do you know where your painting is, your portrait? And she said, yes. It's hanging over my fireplace. And, and Mrs. Johnson said, well, I don't think it's supposed to be there, and we'd like to have it back to put on display. And Mrs. Mrs. Truman said, well, it's in my house, and that's where it's going to stay. I rather like it, and it, it fills the space over my fireplace. So the White House hired the man who painted it to paint two more. And so the original White House portrait of Bess Truman hangs to this day over the fireplace where Mrs. Truman put it, and it was there when she died. And the two, two you know, replicas, duplicates or triplicates or whatever, one hangs in the White House and the other hangs in the Truman Library, which is run by the National Archives and Records Administration. That so. is so funny. I love that. And and it'll be interesting to see now knowing sort of some of the theatrics behind it, what will happen yeah. in 2025 with the Obama Library and Museum and, and yeah. what sort of transpires and, and what ends up there and how and it does. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah. what, what does this, does this set a precedent? Is this a one-off? Is this, you know, for what, again, I don't know, I should probably research it and I don't know if the, if the information is out there. But why he did this or what the thinking and 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 does this make it I, I, I mean, in in my opinion, I think it make it, it has the potential to make things more difficult because you're going through a private foundation or a dot org as opposed to a dot gov. Mm -hmm. Like if you go to LOC dot gov, that's the library of, of Congress online, you can use any of those photographs and any of those documents that are digitally stored there, or you can go to the physical building of the Library of Congress and say, hey, I'd like to get a copy of this picture, portrait, or you know, image of George Washington. Or like, you go to my website and you go in my books 
Those are all images of first ladies that are taken from the Library of Congress. We, the people, own that. We can access and use that for free. If you go to the uh, uh, Presidential Foundation, well, then you got to get permission. And then there's some potential licensing fees. And do they access all the information or how much access or how much information do they get? So, you know, I mean, you know, you know, thinking as a television producer or a researcher or, or from my own personal, you know, you go to a, a presidential museum that's run by National Archives and Records, like going to the Smithsonian. We're going to anywhere else that's owned, that's operated by the federal government. You walk in, you look at stuff in this. A foundation can tell people no, I think. Interesting. I mean, of course, it wouldn't be exciting if it all came together so easily, right? I mean, that's why you've got two great books full of it. And by the way, if you order, uh, going to Andy Oak's website, Andrew Oak's website, is the best way to do it. I like my books because I got them signed. It's a go-to gift for me. Uh, let's also tell people about the celebration of the First Lady's Day. Absolutely, absolutely. And this is all. You can find information on this on the website, firstladiesman.com. So I sit on a board of directors with my dear friends and, and a lot of presidential First Lady uh, relatives and ancestors. But my dear friend, uh, Reverend Nicholas Inman, who uh, um, in, uh, con- conceptualized and, and, and runs the Marshfield, Missouri Cherry Blossom Festival in Marshfield, Missouri, he called me to say, let's do a First Lady's Day, and we need the First Lady's Man on there. And we started from there and have built it out, and we've got relatives from Truman, Grant, uh, Taft, Coolidge, um, 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 uh, gosh, I'm, I'm forgetting so many, but, but there's, there's, there's a, t- uh, Eisenhower, McKinley, uh, it just goes on and on and on. I, I, uh, so, so what we have, we have gotten recognized by the national calendar people, uh, is the last Saturday of April. And this coincides with when Martha Washington, around the time when Martha Washington became the first first lady as president Washington became the first president in April of 19, you know, 90, whatever. And, and so the last Saturday this year, it's April 27th of 2024. We celebrate first ladies day and we're making a lot of headway with congressmen and senators and, and our politicians at the federal level. I think we've got people in, in Ohio, uh, Virginia, California, Missouri, Indian, Indiana, don't quote me on all those, but we've got some folks that are lined up that are ready to bring this to the house floor where it will get approved and then go to the Senate floor that we will have a federally recognized first ladies day, the last Saturday in April. And like I say, the, the, well, the, 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 the national first ladies day, li- the national first ladies library in Canton, Ohio is celebrating and recognizing this year. We've got their director on our board of directors. Um, so we've got a lot of big names and big people and stuff moving forward to this that, that one day, hopefully, hopefully by 2005, when you go to Office Depot or, or Amazon.com or wherever you go to buy your desk calendars or your calendars, in February, it'll say President's Day on that Monday coming up here today uh, 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 in February. And then you'll flip to April, and that last Saturday, you'll see First Lady's Day. I and the idea that. is – yeah, it's great. It's really great. And there's a firstladiesday.org uh, that we're developing, and we'll be, uh, you know, taking donations and, 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 and setting up events and working with local. The, the idea is to, to do something within your community that these first ladies do within their communities and within all the different states and their causes for mental health and childhood obesity and, and, and uh, 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 anti-drug campaigns and beautification of America, just making your community, your schools, your neighborhoods, and the world a better place and doing that because that's what the First Ladies are all kind of doing with their philanthropies and their efforts and, and outside of politics just to make the world a better place. And so it's a, it's a, it's a week-long celebration or process or project, you know, plant a tree or this. And this year, because of the passing of, of Rosalind Carter, uh, which everyone knows about, and, and, uh, and to remember her, she is being honored uh, this year on uh, First Lady's Day on Saturday, 
April 27th out in Marshfield, Missouri, and at the National First Ladies Library in Canton. And we'll have various speakers and family members and panels and all kinds of events surrounding that day. Very cool. And I just love the idea, whatever. I know it's just, it doesn't really matter, but it does matter. I want to be able to get a calendar and see it on there just like I see President's Day on there. I like that. I like the idea of it being a nationally recognized holiday. There's just yeah. something no, next level about that. <laughs> it, it is. I, and, you know, uh, one of the side effects, and there's been so many that, that I couldn't have planned or couldn't have known when I signed on to produce the, the series for C-SPAN and the, Washington, the, uh, the White House Historical Association, The First Lady's Influence and Image. You can get access to that on my on my website, too, firstladiesman.com. Go to the video page. It's at the top. You can watch all the episodes, every first lady. At that point, it was Martha Washington through Michelle Obama. All those episodes are there. But, you know, I go around and I speak, and people read these books, and they talk about, they, they read about and find out about all these places that relate to first ladies. And some of them are first ladies only, like first ladies' uh, 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 birth homes and, and resting places if, if they're different from their president. And there, there are some in the 1800s where some first ladies are buried in their hometowns and not with their presidential husbands who happen to remarry. You know, there's all kinds of different stuff that goes on. But, but, but the bottom line is a lot of these places, like I mentioned, the, the Pierce Brigade and the Pierce Home in Concord, you know, these little places, they need people to visit. They need people to donate. They need people to walk through the door. They, they, they need to stay active because if they don't, then, you know, like we were talking at the beginning and JJ asked, you know, who, where, does, where is this stuff? Where does this stuff go? Well, it's going to disappear. I mean, e- even, even the verbal telling of the story or, or reading about them. And so when, when we see on a calendar First Lady's Day, you know, a little light bulb goes off. We say like, oh, wow, you know what? Yeah, maybe we need to do this. I'm also, here's a little, here's a little news flash and exclusive. And I don't know when it's going to happen because I'm not the technical brains behind it. But I'm working on a First Lady's Man app. And cool. it's going to have all kind of, I know, right? Love Pretty that. Slick. I know I'm I'm just leaping into the into the uh, into the internet world, the smartphones and everything, just running full steam with 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 the emergency brake in one hand. But but we're gonna have all kinds of resources on First Ladies Man app that are also gonna link to the First Ladies Day and these locations and finding these places and getting people to walk through the doors and knowing where these things are. And I have I've got people from the very very beginning. I didn't again I didn't construct it this way. It's a neat little side effect. But people come up and they're like. I read your book and I didn't even know this place existed and I'm going to drive there and I'm going to go there because I want to learn more and I want to mm-hmm. see uh, Ellen Wilson's paintings in person or I want to see the, 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 the little secretary, uh, you know, like a, like, a, um, uh, uh, like, a, like, a, like a lap desk. They called it a secretary or sec- yeah, sec- a little wooden secretary. It's beautiful, black lacquered and the painting and the flowers on it that Jane Pierce used to write so many letters. You know, and she would sit in her lap as she rode from carriage or sat in, you know, she didn't have a, a desk or a formal office or anything like that. She would sit in front of the fireplace and maybe right by firelight or sit out on the front porch. And write. I mean, these artifacts are there. These places are there. These resources are there. These stories are there of these women that helped formulate and, and construct and continue and promote uh, America and 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 these men, these presidents, these revolutionaries could not have done it without the women at their side and in their corner and expressing their ideas. And without America, the modern world is a very, very different place, good, bad, or otherwise. All this stuff that comes along with it, it's just a different place. And we don't give enough credit to these women who helped and continue to help make that happen in the modern world, all going back to Martha Washington, and if George Washington had married anyone other than Martha Washington, in all likelihood, America wouldn't happen, and then the modern world is a much different place. I mean, see, we can bring it all back to the presidents when we're talking about the First Ladies. And to your point about learning so much about the First Ladies on President's Day, since it is President's Day, I'll note that you learn so much more about those presidents, too, once you learn about the First Ladies kind of gives you a glimpse even deeper into who they were and what their life was like getting to know these first ladies along the way too. Absolutely. Well put. Okay. So um, if they want to find you, Andrew Oak, get your books, maybe get a t-shirt, follow along with your journey. How do they do that? 
I am a firstladiesman at gmail.com, and my website is firstladiesman.com. I try and make it as easy as possible. If you Google First Ladies Man, you'll find me. You'll find firstladiesman.com. You'll find all these resources. You'll find the contact, firstladiesman at gmail. Give me a holler. Give me a shout. Give me an email. Follow me on Facebook. I'm Andrew Oak on Facebook. I'm First Ladies Man on Instagram. Neat little daily facts and stuff all february is fun i've been celebrating famous uh, uh uh weddings through history and and talking about who was first lady when the famous people got married and then tell you a little bit about how the first lady married the president and their kids and just neat little stuff like i just recently learned this myself that, that eliza johnson a first lady we wouldn't think of if we were naming 5 10 15 20 30 maybe even 40 first ladies eliza johnson was the youngest first lady to marry she was 16 years old and andrew johnson was 18 years old oh my god in greenville tennessee those two crazy kids got married <laughs> and and she's She's one of two first ladies that taught her future or taught her husband and future president to read and write. I, I mean, wow. that's how important these women are. Uh, uh, you know, the man who, who very, very, um, you know, in unfortunate circumstances became president of the United States after Lincoln is assassinated, but also the first president to be impeached. It didn't go through. It didn't take or it didn't. He was not found guilty of the impeachment, what have you. But there's a lot of first lady and presidential first in, in the Johnson administration. And Eliza Johnson goes back to one of the two first ladies, the other being Abigail Fillmore, who taught the future president of the United States to read and write as a teacher. And, uh, and she ends up to be the youngest married first lady at 16 when, when Andrew Johnson was, was 18 and starting their lives together in Greenville, Tennessee. That's a crazy story. How far we've come with education, too. Like that, you know, just think about that. By the way, Andrew Oak, spelled O-C-H if you're looking for him. First ladies man here on KFGO. Andrew, thank you so much for the conversation. Of course, on KFGO, we're celebrating President's Day by bringing you the stories that you aren't getting anywhere else. Keep it <laughs> tuned here to the Mighty 790 and 104.7 FM KFGO. Thank